Bom, olá, nós estamos aqui no projeto Pretzel Talk, temos mais uma edição do projeto Pretzel Talk, temos a, é um projeto que foi concebido na época da pandemia, que tem o objetivo de promover encontro é, entre pessoas que falam de assuntos interessantes é, e, que, e, que, e que transformam uma conversa, uma boa prosa, num elemento de inspiração para a nossa comunidade. Essa é uma iniciativa da Congregação Betel, é, que tem o apoio da Associação dos Amigos da Universidade Hebraica de Jerusalém e, fundamentalmente, a gente leva assuntos de interesse geral. Nós temos aqui a oportunidade de estar hoje aqui com o Mr. Andrew Roberts, é, que ele vai contar é, a respeito da, do papel que ele tem, e o Ricardo Salderman. Que, vai, que é um brasileiro, gaúcho, que vai também fazer a mediação dessa conversa com o Andrew. E o nosso pano de fundo né, dessa nossa conversa é a respeito é, da, da vida e da obra do Mr. Churchill, que é uma figura icônica e emblemática na história da humanidade. Então, espero que vocês desfrutem desse, desse, desse momento entre nós. Obrigado. Ok. So, well, uh... I am very pleased and honored to to be the host of uh, Lord Roberts, uh, former Andrew Roberts, the, and writer of an extensive number of books on uh, biographies on important people that change the history of the world. So it's my honor and my pleasure to be here. Lord Roberts, hello, how are you? Thank you very much indeed, uh, Ricardo. It's a great honor to be on the show. Well, first question is, when I start reading your books, I start reading the books from Andrew Roberts. Now you're Lord Roberts of Belgravia. So what does it change from being Andrew to Lord? Does it change too much in your life? No, you must call me Andrew. That will be fine. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> <laughs> no, my, 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 uh, my, my pen name, as it's called, will still be Andrew Roberts, definitely. I don't want to confuse, uh, confuse people. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, uh, recently, uh, well, your latest book was a book uh, uh, called Conflict uh, with uh, General David Petrios. But before that, you have this marvelous book, it's Walking with Destiny, uh, an enormous and marvelous uh, biography uh, on Churchill. And uh, you were the, one of the few ones that had access to the King's uh, archives. So, Tell us about the, tell us a little thing about that. How was the experience of having uh, been in touch with those archives and what that changed on Churchill's former biographies? Yes, I was very fortunate um, that the late Queen, Queen Elizabeth II, allowed me to be the first Churchill biographer to uh, be able to work on her father's diaries. And of course, King George VI met Churchill every Tuesday of the Second World War. They had lunch together at Buckingham Palace and they talked about all of the great issues, all of the great uh, important things that were happening in the war. And then luckily the King went back afterwards and, and wrote um, down what Churchill said. So I suddenly had a source, a primary source of the most important things uh, said in each week of the Second World War when Churchill was prime minister. It was a uh, it was a wonderful thing. It manages to um, therefore uh, add to the sum of knowledge that we have about Winston Churchill. And um, it allows all sorts of insights into what Churchill was thinking um, during the war. But the, the king wasn't that fun of Churchill at the beginning. So no. how did it change? <laughs> That's right. I mean, and neither was neither was um, Churchill terribly fond of the king, because the king, of course, had um, been a great supporter of appeasement, uh, the policy of appeasing Nazi Germany before the Second World War, and uh, Winston Churchill had been a great supporter of the king's elder brother, King Edward VIII, uh, at the time of the abdication crisis in 1936. So they both came to the other. Uh, like slight suspicion, frankly, and um, very, very quickly that evaporated completely and they became f firm friends. In fact, 
Um, he was the only one of the king's prime ministers who uh, the king referred to by his Christian name. He called him Winston, whereas he didn't do that with any of the other prime ministers. And um, and the queen mother, um, who was uh, who was uh, King George VI's wife, uh, also got on extremely well with Churchill, having been doubtful about him. And this happened in a matter of weeks. You know, they put the interests of the country first, and then after that, very quickly, they became great friends. And uh, well, as we're talking about the, the the royal family, so in his second term, Churchill was the first prime minister from uh, the late queen. So how was his influence on her for his longer reign realm? Well, he sort of worked her. He was, he was a bit in love with her. In fact, he didn't mind sort of admitting that to his, uh, uh, to his um, staff and private secretaries. He, he did worship her. And, uh, and she was also um, hugely lucky to have somebody as experienced as him. I mean, he'd gone into public life um, in the time of her ancestor, Queen Victoria. And so there was nobody more experienced than uh, Winston Churchill in British politics by 1950, uh, 1952, when she became queen. And so this worked brilliantly. They also got on very well because they were both uh, racehorse owners and their, <laughs> their horses would race against each other sometimes. And uh, and Churchill told the Queen that it was a great pity that they both, both couldn't win um, these uh, these races, but one had to and the other and the other couldn't. But um, yeah, the, the, the private secretaries would say that they would um, be supposedly meeting for half an hour. And then an hour later, you'd still hear through the closed doors, the Queen and, and Churchill roaring with laughter and obviously having a great time. So, so they, get, they got on very well and the Queen learnt an enormous amount. And actually, interestingly, just before she died um, last year, she told Liz Truss, her last prime minister, uh, she said, and, and you know, my first prime minister was Winston Churchill. And she'd also said that to Tony Blair and to David Cameron. So it was a very good way of letting these uh, these new prime ministers, these young prime ministers who weren't even born when Churchill was alive, to uh, to know that uh, the Queen had that kind of, of uh, years of experience. To, to put them in their right position. <laughs> <laughs> well, we have a constitutional monarchy and they're very much the servants of the, oh, very, of the crown. Very, very discreetly, she would say, listen, I've been here a long time and my first prime minister was Winston Churchill. Okay. <laughs> so uh, I, I want to change the subject a little bit. And you have uh, marvelous uh, biographies on, on uh, uh, Lord Halifax, and uh, you wrote about the masters and commanders. So we wrote about uh, Roosevelt and you wrote a lot about uh, Napoleon and uh, you have a, a very nice memorabilia on Napoleon. So uh, my question is, well, Napoleon was uh, an enemy of the, of the British empire. So how come did it, you have so much interest in writing about Napoleon and why is he still important today? We have, we have a film being released uh, now. So uh, if Winston Churchill is too important, why Napoleon is, is too important today? Well, um, with regard to the film, the new Ridley Scott film, don't go and watch it for the history. Um, okay. it, has, it has marvelous <laughs> spoiler alert. scenes. Valid, uh, valid spoiler alert. Okay. <laughs> wonderful uniforms, wonderful battle scenes, wonderful, uh, um, you know, palaces and so on. But um, but the history is completely ludicrous. I'm afraid from okay. beginning to end. But um, the I uh, know the truth about um, Napoleon is actually much more interesting, much more nuanced, much more complex, much more impressive, really, than anything that uh, Ridley Scott or indeed anybody else has been able to put onto the silver screen in a movie. Um, the reason that I was interested in him, and I've always been interested in him ever since my father took me to watch the great movie Waterloo uh, when I was about 10 years old, um, is that he is just such a gigantic character. His personality is, is enormous. But at the same time, the things he did, many of them still last to this day. Many of the institutions of the Enlightenment um, are still around. The uh, Nap Napoleonic Code, you know, is the basis for European law today, for example. 
And, uh, and there are so many other things in terms of his infrastructure projects, his uh, un um, educational reforms in, in France, the Lycée, the Sorbonne and so on, uh, his administrative reforms, the uh, the man, the Banque de France, the Légion d'honneur, the Cour de Comte and so on. There's just so much um, about uh, modern Europe that we can't really understand unless we have an appreciation of Napoleon. Now, that said, as you pointed out, I'm an Englishman and so I was delighted. I'm totally thrilled that he lost the Battle of Waterloo. I wouldn't have wanted him to have defeated my country. But my country already had many of the representative institutions um, that that one needed in a in a sort of uh, in a fully fledged uh, modern nation. Napoleon, of course, was a dictator, but what he overthrew was the French Revolution. It wasn't representative democracy. Okay, and uh, what was there a difference between, for example, uh, the wars of French and and uh, Brit Britain? From Napoleon and Wellington to the time of Louis XIV and uh, the Duke of Marlborough, um, it... not in. It's a good question, and um, there wasn't that much difference in terms of the weaponry. The musket, for example, and the cannonball were were pretty much the same in eighteen. Um, 1804, as they had been at the time of the Battle of Blenheim in 1704, for example. What was different was the way in which uh, the Napoleonic uh, reforms in the army brought about the corps system, which went, meant that each corps had um, infantry, cavalry, artillery and staff um, and so they were able to act independently. You didn't get that in the big battles of uh, of the um, wars of Austrian succession and the wars of Spanish succession, for example. OK, uh, let's uh, go fast forward a little bit on time and uh, talk about a little bit about um, uh, modern Churchill. I mean, he was he was a a fan of science and during the war he had uh, the help and uh, before that of uh, Frederick Lindemann that was a scientist and he had many you know he was always interested in in science for example in establishing the royal air force and uh, investing in in raiders when he was a minister so tell us about a little bit this this other side of churchill that few people know uh, his uh, his interest in science and uh, what what would he was looking for on that? Yes, it's very interesting because he had no actual background in science. He had, of course, not gone to university. He'd gone to Sandhurst, the British military training um, academy for officers, and uh, where they hadn't been taught science of uh, any um, any serious degree at all. But he recognised. Um, and he was very largely self-taught, but that was largely in the classics and in uh, in philosophy and uh, and politics and so on. Again, not the sciences. And so, but he recognised as a uh, as a young man, a young politician, how important science was and how it could change societies. And so, by the nineteen um, twenties, uh, when he befriended the professor of physics at Oxford, um, Professor Lindemann, later Lord Charwell. Uh, and this man became his best friend, essentially. He visits Churchill more often at Chequers and at Chartwell, the house that uh, Churchill um, lived in, more than anybody else outside the family. And they talked science obsessively. And uh, even in the 1920s, so this is, uh, this is 15 years before um, Albert Einstein wrote the famous letter to FDR about the importance of um, of creating a nuclear bomb. Even 15 years before that, in 1922, Churchill was writing about how a bomb the size of an orange can destroy an entire city, and how important it was for um, the you know for the Western um, nations to uh, to get there first, essentially. Um... And also with Alan Turing, he had a special, um, I mean, importance on develop on developing the computer that we nowadays use, right? On, well, on Bachelor Park. 
absolutely that. I mean, of course, each time they had a military application, uh, Churchill with the nuclear bomb, of course, he totally understood all the science about the nuclear bomb uh, in a way that was not true of an awful lot of the British politicians and indeed the American politicians. And that is because of Professor Lindemann. With regard to Alan Turing and Bletchley Park, that too, of course, had a very important military application in that it allowed us to break the German codes, not just us, the French and the Poles uh, and others, you know, were very much involved in in this. But um, but the people in Hut Six and uh, and others of the huts in Bletchley Park, such as Alan Turing, they were at the absolute cutting edge of um, of uh, decrypting. And uh, it was because they broke into the uh, Enigma code using the and uh, essentially the ultra. Um, um, feeds that were coming from the ultra machine that they were able to read the Germans codes and probably shorten the Second World War by about a year, saving hundreds of thousands, if not millions of lives. Um, Churchill won the war, but lost the empire in a certain way. Uh, and he, he, there is a famous quote on him that he says that um, I didn't find a war to lose the empire, but after all, he did. So did he regret it that, I mean, uh, he also, had, uh, although the, that looked like he had a nice relation with Roosevelt, it was not quite like that. So I wonder if you could tell us a, bit, a little bit about that. And um, how was your relation with Roosevelt? And, and how was his feeling about, after all, uh, having the empire dismantled? dismantled? Yes, I think the... Um... The quotation that you're uh, referring to is his speech of the 10th of November 1942 at Mansion House, where he said that I did not become the king's first minister in order to preside over the liquidation of the British Empire. And um, although he never actually gave away any part of the empire himself, either in his first premiership or his second uh, Indian summer premiership of the 1950s, um, of course, the British Empire was on the, very much on the way out by the end of the Second World War, because uh, India, of course, was given away two years later. And then um, after he was, uh, he, he finally left office in 1955, the British Empire unraveled very quickly. Um, and he had been an imperialist all his life. He believed that the, um, that the role of Britain really was to uh, try to ensure the best possible um, life and development of uh, the millions of people who lived in the British Empire. He did believe that it uh, gave huge advantages in terms of infrastructure and peace and law and order uh, in language education and uh, so on railways and so on to the um, native peoples of the British Empire and so he did want to hold on to it but he simply couldn't because we were bankrupted essentially by 1945. Uh, we had spent every part of our uh, of our national wealth to trying to defeat Adolf Hitler. By the way, I think it's an untarnishable glory that if you are going to lose an empire, you lose it like that, rather than just trying to uh, um, trying to hang on to it uh, to the bitter end. And um, it was the noblest possible way to lose an empire. But but that's what happened. We we had no more money, and we couldn't uh, continue it after the war. And he recognised that. And and was the Commonwealth of Nations. A in a certain way that he uh, helped to, to, to build in uh, a, a chance to reestablish this uh, British dominance or this British influence? Not at all, no, no. That That's not the story of the British Commonwealth okay. at all. It's much more a, a, a case of trying to stay friendly, essentially, with the countries that, uh, that did constitute the empire in the past. And it's been an extraordinary success. In fact, we're getting countries now um, like Mozambique, for example, that were never part of the British Empire in the first place. And they're joining the British Commonwealth, which is, I think, 54 countries now um, and uh, and growing. And it, so it's been a tremendous uh, success. But the idea of it being some kind of a fig leaf for empire is uh, is completely wrong, because of those 54 countries, only about 16 of them have the um, have King Charles III as the head of state of those countries, and uh, some of those might be changing that as well. And um, 
Uh, so it's not uh, it's nothing to do with them um, with empire or dominance. It's to do with good fellowship, with trade, with the English language, with all of the things that uh, can come as an advantage of being part of a uh, of a peaceful group of mostly democracies uh, who believe in uh, in um, the rule of law. Okay, um, let's talk about uh, about Clementine. Uh, there is a marvelous book on Sonia of, of, from Sonia Purnell that opens a little bit, and I have the book from Lady Songs about the letters between Churchill and Clementine, and he was a he she was a huge influence on his life, and he he did she did change a lot of his ideas during his long relation. So I wonder I wonder if you have some thoughts about that. So... Yes, uh, she was a she was a huge support to him, especially at the low moments. You know, Churchill's life was an absolute roller coaster. Uh, he was constantly, you know, going up and down and up and down in his uh, in his politics. And she was somebody who was able to provide um, unquestioning, complete, and total support. Um, she was a very strong willed woman. Um, she didn't impose herself on his uh, on his political views actually uh, terribly much. She. Uh, um, she never got involved in the in the decision making with regard to the Second World War, for example, the, the strategy or anything like that. But what she did do was to give absolute. She was a sort of tigress in um, defence of her of her husband's interests, and she was a um, uh, <laughs> she was a, she was a sort of aristocratic tough lady who uh, who knew what she wanted and. Uh, and it turned out to be a tremendously successful marriage. There are a couple of moments, of course, in 1940, there's one moment in the June of that year where she writes to him and uh, and basically says that he's got to behave much better to his staff because uh, he's, yes. he's become, uh, you know, impossible to uh, to work for. And um, and he did become uh, better. I don't know how long, long that lasted for, but nonetheless, that's the only letter that we have that between them for the year 1940 but that's because they were living in the same house together and so you know if she had something to tell him um except for on that one occasion she would uh, tell it to him uh, to his face it was a wonderfully successful marriage and uh, they they adored one another and he was completely faithful to her and so on it's uh, it's one of the great uh, marriages in history okay thank you uh well i had the pleasure to listen to an interview from you with uh, Douglas Murray on the Uncancelled History, marvelous program. I suggest uh, to our, the, our audience to, to listen to that. And uh, so in, in the beginning of the year 2000, uh, Churchill was elected the most uh, famous British or the most important one. And this is being discussed now. So do you understand this discussion is, is valid or, or does it resi reside on this wokeness that we are living in. So how how, how do you feel about that, uh, Andrew? I think I think he would still probably win. Um the uh if there was another vote taken today, it would be very interesting to see whether he would or or not actually, who was the greatest Englishman. For me, it's always Churchill. Churchill got the First World War right. He managed to warn before the First World War about the rise and the danger of the hegemony of uh, Germany. Uh, then, of course, before the Second World War, he got that right too, warning about Nazism and the rise of Hitler. Um, and then during the Second World War, he and uh, Roosevelt, of course, managed together to, uh, along with their generals, to fashion the grand strategy that led to victory in the West. Um, whilst being able to keep an alliance up with um, with Russia. And then after the Second World War, he was the first person to point out that Russia was a serious danger to Eastern Europe and uh, and indeed the rest of the world. So uh, in his Iron Curtain speech in Fulton, Missouri in March 1946. So of these four great issues of the 20th century, I would argue the four biggest issues of the 20th century, he got all of them right. And, uh, and that's what makes him so great, essentially. Um, but there are people today who, of course, taking advantage of the democracy and freedom of speech that he fought for, um, attempt to push him off his pedestal, to bring him down, to uh, attack him, uh, to uh, make him seem a smaller figure than he is, um, by essentially very often wrenching quotations of his out of 
context. Um, he gave uh, he gave many thousands of speeches. Uh, he wrote um, eight hundred articles. He wrote thirty seven books. Um, so he wrote more than you know Dickens and Shakespeare put together. And so of course there are a few sentences here or a few remarks there that you're going to be able to pounce on um, nearly a hundred years later. And uh, and try and make him out to be a uh, you know a bad man, but frankly the witness of history is so powerfully behind him it strikes me that these people's books will not be read um, in uh, in the next hundred years. And and this uh, um, criticism comes mainly from the left that he that he uh, didn't support. I mean he wanted to to keep on fighting against communism. So do you understand that this this is the 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 origin of this criticism? Well, and also the other the other lot is the extreme right as well. Fascists don't like him, of course, because he okay. helped destroy Hitler. <laughs> um, so you know, you also get the criti the critique from the extreme uh, right as well. Uh, Neo Nazis hate uh, Churchill almost as much as as communists do. Um, there is a there is during the Blitz. Uh, Roosevelt had doubts about uh, helping uh, Britain to win the war or, or to make the land lease and so on. So tell us a little bit about the relation about Roosevelt and Churchill. Did they really get along? Did they, I mean, uh, Churchill had second intentions uh, regarding his help. So let us talk about this a little bit. Oh, they did genuinely become proper friends by um, in the immediate aftermath of Pearl Harbor um, in December 1941. Uh, Churchill went over and stayed for three weeks in the White House as a guest of FDR's. So and that's the would... final scene that uh, Roosevelt sees him naked and uh, so Churchill important. says, uh, I have nothing to hide from the president. <laughs> exactly. The Prime Minister of Great Britain has nothing to hide from the presidents of the United States. Exactly that. <laughs> um, but, um, <laughs> but yeah, they got on like a house on fire. He didn't much enjoy the cocktails um, that FDR mixed for him. He he wasn't into American cocktails, but other than that, they got on like a house on fire. And uh, and okay. together they were able at these meetings, these um, these meetings in the map room and, and the Oval Office, to fashion a grand strategy which had the Americans landing in North Africa by the November of 1942, and then of course crossing over into Sicily and Italy, and then crossing the Channel in. January in sorry in June 1944 so you know it was a really really useful um and important uh, alliance now you're right um there was a moment in the October of 1944 when Churchill worried that um that FDR um was um was essentially putting American interests before allied interests but then FDR worried also that Churchill was putting British interests before allied interests you know this was going to always happen towards the end of a uh, of a of a world war but nonetheless their personal friendship uh, stayed uh, intact and it was a, a very moving moment when in the February of uh, 1945 in Alexandria Churchill had to say goodbye to FDR and he knew it was going to be for the last time that he'd never see him again because uh, FDR's health would had collapsed by then so um, and he was to die of course only a couple of um, months later so it was uh, it was a genuine friendship they had lots in common they were both very much aristocrats of their own countries they uh, were on the um, in the in the center of uh, of politics. Uh, they uh, admired each other personally, and um, and so we were very lucky that there were these two people who were in such key positions at such important moment of world history. Okay, thank you. There's a I want let we're talking to the Jewish community in Brazil, and the church was very fan of the Jewish community. Uh, of of the Jewish nation, and he, he was one one of the one one of the people that helped a lot on the Balfour Declaration. And there is a book from Sir Martin Gilbert uh, called the Ch J Church and the Jews. So let's talk a little bit about this relation and uh, and his view on Israel, uh, on 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 the existence of Israel and of the Jewish people. So. Yeah, well, I'm glad you mentioned Martin's book because it's actually it's it's literally behind me in that uh, bookshelf that uh, that's behind me. It's just at the bottom there. 
Um, it's a great book. I do recommend it to, for everybody to read immediately after they've read mine. Um, Absolutely. And... <laughs> in this order. In this order. <laughs> um, and um, yes, he was a philo Semite. He liked Jews. He'd grown up um, uh, with Jews. His father had liked Jews. Uh, they went on holiday together. They um, they you know mixed socially, and that was quite unusual for British upper classes in the um, in the late nineteenth century, uh, early twentieth century. There was, um, I'm afraid, a great deal of anti-Semitism amongst well every section of um, society in those days, but also uh, specifically amongst the upper classes. And Churchill completely turned his back on all of that, and uh, and he had. Um, uh, he had a really strong and positive attitude towards uh, Jews and, of course, ultimately, as you mentioned, with regard to the Balfour Declaration with Zionism. Um, he uh, he was um, somebody who recognised Hitler and the Nazis very early on for what they really were, partly because of um, Hitler's stance towards the Jews. The Jews were a kind of um, early warning system for Churchill to spot what kind of a um, a politician Hitler really was, and um, and so yes, this was an important aspect of his uh, of his life and his career, and uh, and as I say, it was it was unusual. It was a, almost a sort of uh, morally brave thing to do to stick up for for Jews in uh, in the nineteen twenties and thirties. Well, and Churchill was one of the first, together with Eisenhower and with uh, General Zukov, to not to let people destroy the concentration camps so people wouldn't say that that never existed so um so thinking about nowadays what's going on on the world now and uh, we always and we always come back to churchill so why is he still important and which lessons could we could we take from from churchill talking about what's happening in Ukraine and especially what's happening now in Israel against uh, Hamas. So well, this why is one of the, is too important? This is one of the great things about Churchill is that his, um, his thoughts and his writings, his teachings, his speeches uh, still do have tremendous um, uh, relevance, modern relevance, even, uh, even 60 or so years after his death. Um, with regard to Ukraine, um, since you mentioned it, of course, President Zelensky, uh, who's been called Churchill with an iPhone, is uh, somebody who has shown great Churchillian leadership um, in the way that he's responded to the uh, monstrous Russian invasion of uh, of his country. So you see him going out night after night, refusing to leave the capital, um, surrounding himself with his ministers, not letting his family leave the uh, the capital, and uh, and making it clear that he's going to fight it out and fight to the death. Well, that's all exactly what Winston Churchill did during the uh, during the Blitz. And, uh, and the great broadcasts that Churchill made, including, of course, the uh, We Shall Fight on the Beaches speech, have essentially been paraphrased on occasion by uh, Zelensky. So you can see that he is still the sort of standard um, uh, sort of watermark for, for military leadership. With regard to uh, what's happening in um, the Holy Land at the moment, um, it seems there that he also has tremendous relevance because he made it quite clear very early on in the uh, war that um, the German, uh, that the Nazis had to be absolutely extirpated and destroyed. He uh, didn't believe in uh, in ceasefires <laughs> to, to uh, look at. In fact, his great uh, phrase, wars are not won by evacuations, that he said in uh, in um, Dunkirk, Dunkirk at the time of Dunkirk. Well, wars aren't won by ceasefires either. And um, so in his uh, example, um, I think uh, were he alive today, it's quite clear what he would say about Hamas, that um, that it is the, uh, the right now of Israel to do everything in its power to destroy Hamas as a military force forever. Yes, uh, to the, have the unconditional defeat of Hamas. I mean, there's no negotiation. Okay. Well, you can't. You see, you, it's quite clear you can't negotiate with them. I mean, the the events of the seventh of October. You can negotiate with them in order to get some hostages out, and as a short term. Uh, as that is happening today. 
as happened today. But you can't um, negotiate with them long term because not only obviously does their constitution call for the destruction of um, Israel, but it also calls for the for the massacre and the annihilation of the Jewish race wherever they are. So that is that's a sort of um, a line beyond which nobody can conduct meaningful long term negotiations. So the only thing to do is a, a matter of self defense is to is to destroy this uh, this enemy this death cult but in a certain way uh, andrew the box the pandora box have been opened and we see a rise of anti-semitism that we saw the, yesterday in ireland uh, fights against between uh, people against the arabs and the arabs and, and i mean we, we're looking at we're seeing this rising all over the world so do you think there is a solution for that? I mean, besides knowing the reality, but people don't want to know the reality or they don't. The, uh, it's the, very depressing, isn't it? Yeah. Um, the, our, our chief rabbi here, um, Jonathan Sachs, the previous chief, chief rabbi, um, who I knew well and 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 liked very much, really uh, believed that anti-Semitism was a mutating disorder. It was like a bacillus. It essentially, once you managed to push it down in one place, it would pop up in another one in a in a slightly different form. Obviously, um, the events of the seventh of October and since show that it's uh, it is still mutating. Um, I think that one thing that one can do, the best thing, of course, to do with um, to, to fight anti-Semitism is to um, is education. And what we must make sure is that when uh, Gaza eventually does have a new government and and uh, uh, Hamas is, as I say, extirpated, you cannot have one in which eight year old Palestinian children, Gazan children are, are taught that it's a good thing to kill Jews. You, you also have this in the textbooks that are taught in schools on the West Bank as well. I mean, this is an absolute that is a recipe for generational conflict. If you uh, if you continue to have small children being taught that kind of uh, disgusting um, thing in their schools. So that is something that uh, that we're going to have to look at, I think, very carefully is, is the is the whole issue of the education of the next generation, not just, of course, Palestinian children, but right the way across the world. Yeah. And uh, this is so true. We see now 80 years after the war, uh, the first country that was uh, aside Israel was Germany. The first the first politician that went to Israel was the, the Prime Minister Schultz from Germany, I and mean, he was the first one. And if we look 80 years ago, uh, Germany was what's the monster that is now uh, the Palestinians or or Gaza or or Hamas. So peace is possible, but it depends on education. Absolutely. I think I think it might have been Willy Brandt um, was the first German Chancellor. No, I mean visit. now in this crisis. In this, in this crisis. crisis. Yeah, after, seven, it... after October seven. That yes, no, of course, and um, Schultz has been excellent. He's made some very, very good speeches. But you know, in um, in Germany, you still have these uh, these big demonstrations, pro-Palestinian demonstrations. Uh, in France, President Macron refused to join the pro-Israel uh, march um, a few weeks ago. Uh, we here in London have demonstrations of three hundred thousand people plus, um, and. Uh, and you know the um, uh, the sheer level of ignorance of as well about what yes. is actually happening uh, in the Middle East is is terrifying, um, and and historical ignorance as well. You know the talk of of um, of a Palestinian nation. There's never been such a thing as a Palestinian nation, and yet uh, historically, um, in. Uh, uh, in Palestine or anywhere else. And so you really do have this very um, worrying level of sheer ignorance, frankly, and ignorance about Jewish history as well, which I think should be uh, taught as um, part of every school's uh, curriculum, not least because, of course, the Judaic uh, contribution to um, Judeo-Christian civilization is the uh, is the basis for all of our lives. Absolutely. Well, Going back to, to Churchill, um, he made a lot of, uh, when I do some speeches in Brazil, I said that Churchill did a lot of mistakes on retail, but did everything wrong, everything right on wholesale. So uh, 
yeah. Uh, when you look at the when you look at the mistakes, I, he actually said in January uh, 1916 when he was in the uh, in the trenches fighting there as the result of one of his mistakes, the Dardanelles yeah. campaign, his biggest mistake, in fact. Uh, he said to his wife, um, uh, wrote to her and said, I should have made nothing if I had not made mistakes. And and when you look at his life, getting the, oh, I don't know, there are any number of them, the women's suffrage wrong, uh, the gold standard, the abdication crisis, the black and tans, of course, the, uh, the Dardanelles catastrophe where 157,000 troops were killed, wounded. Um, and captured, you have to um, recognize that Churchill made a lot of mistakes, but he learned from them. He learned from every single one of the ones that I've just mentioned. And he was one of those politicians who did learn from his mistakes. And there are very few of those, especially today. Um, you tend to get uh, get fewer and fewer. Yes, be, be, be aware of those politicians that are infallible. Right. That's the thing that <laughs> yeah, there are oh, there are a few of oh, them around. The dangerous ones. We yes. all we all know we all know one or two that think that they're yes. infallible. Yes. Yes. Um, I wonder if I could also just go back to uh, sure. what you were saying earlier about the um, the Israel Hamas um, conflict because you know history uh, is usually a very good guide, um, but. In the book, uh, Conflict, which you kindly mentioned, which yes. um, David Petraeus and I have just written, we uh, in which we, we cover um, important aspects of, um, of uh, military operations in build-up areas, um, like Mosul and Najaf and, uh, and um, Fallujah and so on. Um, actually, Gaza is an awful lot more difficult than all of those because it's bigger and it's got more people in it. And uh, and Hamas have obviously had a great deal of time to rig up their booby traps and to set their IEDs and so on. And uh, so I think you probably have to go back to the Second World War, to the Stalingrad and to Monte Cassino, really, to, to see the same kind of military conditions that the IDF is having to uh, fight in. And also, of course, with regard to these tunnels, which you didn't get in either of those um, earlier um, struggles in 1942 and 1943, you have, Hamas have the opportunity to pop up behind uh, the IDF lines. And so that also adds an extremely difficult extra dimension to, um, to this fighting. And David and I do go into this uh, in our book. Yeah, regarding this book, that's your more recent book, uh, you go from 45 to Ukraine and um, with General David Petraeus, he was a uh, commander in Afghanistan, am I right? And uh, Iraq. And, and Iraq, okay. So, well, the war, uh, the first war in, I mean, this, after Kuwait, the second war on, um, on uh, Iraq based on uh, weapons that now doesn't exist. I mean, uh, the prime minister at the time was Tony Blair. I mean, and did he ever accomplish that he did the mistake on that or he well he he goes, he, he goes on and as nothing had happened. He believed um, at the time that very much believed, not least because uh, Saddam Hussein had used weapons of mass destruction on his own people, of course, and the Marsh Arabs, um, that they did exist. And uh, he would, under no circumstances, have started a war on the basis uh, if he if he had known that they didn't exist. They had existed before. Dictators have never before in history voluntarily, secretly destroyed their own arsenals of uh, of uh, weapons. And so, perfectly understandably, he uh, went ahead with that war, believing that they did exist, and he got that wrong. Um, so I don't think that there is that much for him to apologise for. Frankly, it was uh, all the best. Um, intelligence services in the world, including the Mossad and the Chinese and the you name it, all believe that Saddam did have these uh, these weapons. Um, what we and uh, and David, of course, was the person who commanded David Petraeus commanded the surge in um, in Iraq in uh, 2007, which turned the turned the tide of the war um, back into America's favor. And he's very much opposed to the Biden withdrawal, sudden withdrawal from Afghanistan that took place in the August of 2021 um, and uh, which led to such chaos. And which also probably because everything in the world is connected to everything else led to the Russian invasion of um, of uh, 
Ukraine. So all in all, and if a defeat takes place in Ukraine, it's perfectly possible that President Xi might take that as a as a red light to uh, sorry a green light to go into Taiwan. Taiwan. So yes. so one of the question one of the one of the um, messages of our book um, conflict is that um, you have to ha- be able to deter effectively pretty much everywhere, which means you have to have extremely um, high state of um, of preparedness and uh, and obviously spend a lot of money on defense because it's money that's very rarely wasted. Okay. Um, regarding Churchill again, he was um, a strong, uh, I mean, he won the war, he lost the election. We had that chat before some time ago. So uh, why do you understand that he lost the election after after the war? Why why do you think um, uh, it's a question oh, that everybody <laughs> makes me? So uh, yeah, why you no, wonder exactly. that happened? Well, the thing is that we have a prime ministerial constitutional system uh, and not a presidential one. If it had been a presidential one and he'd been against Clement Attlee, he could well have won. But um, he was only standing in one constituency out of 650. And the Conservative Party that was standing in all the other constituencies was not popular. You know, it, had, it had a lot of appeasers in it from before the war. Um, it was uh, didn't seem to want to deliver the huge um, social... Um, and um, nationalization projects that the Labour Party were were promising, and the Labour Party looked as though it was uh, it was modernizing and uh, and um, uh, looking to the future, and it was offering things like nationalization of the coal mines and the Bank of England and so on, which were which were popular at the time and and which the Conservative Party wasn't offering. So, as you say, there was a landslide victory, but it can't be blamed on Churchill. On the day, though, of the uh, of the disaster, when it became pretty clear that it was going to be a landslide victory against Churchill, uh, Clementine said, uh, you remember earlier how I said that she was quite outspoken and fearless. She said to her husband that... Um, um, it might be a blessing in disguise. Yes. Uh, and Churchill replied, well, from where I'm sitting, it seems remarkably well disguised. <laughs> okay. Uh, coming up again, again to the French, the relation between Churchill and France, and also, as you wrote a book on Napoleon, there is your, your, your book, a uh, phrase from him that says, I, of course, I'm exceedingly pro-French. Uh, unfortunately, the French are exceedingly provoking. So, uh, tell us about this relation, and uh, because his relation with the goal was also very odd. But uh, at the end, I mean, were they friends? Were, were they? Did they no. really work together? Uh, because there was a lot of, uh, and there is an, uh, uh, in a book from Sonia Purnell about Clementine, a, a passage where. Um, the goal is very, you know, nasty after the Battle of Oran, and she put both on their places. So, how was this relation between Churchill well, it, and it, it, No, it wasn't. It wasn't friendship. They did admire one another. This is the key thing. When uh, Churchill, uh, Churchill hugely admired the fact that De Gaulle got on that plane on the sixteenth uh, of June, nineteen forty, and came over to London and abandoned France. Uh, made his speech on the eighteenth of June. Uh, set up the um, the Free French and and led them. You know he 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 recognised that that was a, um, a a fine thing to do and that he was you know a great Frenchman. But of course, with regard to the whole um, issue of of the extent to which the French were then going to be able. Um, uh, to um, involve themselves in the strategic decision making, and uh, and everything to all the planning to do with D Day and so on, um, uh, De Gaulle could be tremendously provoking. There were lots of jokes that he made. Um, he said at one point that uh, that De Gaulle reminded him of a llama surprised in her bath. <laughs> <laughs> what that um, means, I have no and, idea. <laughs> and he also he also uh, said that uh, that he had lots of crosses to bear, but the heaviest of the crosses was the cross of Lorraine, which of course was the uh, the symbol of the of the free French. Um, and but um, to to give him his due, de Gaulle had a few zingers that he uh, would fling against uh, against Churchill as well. De Gaulle also fell out much worse, in fact, than with Churchill. Also fell out with um, uh, FDR. 
who thought that he was a um, he was a dictator in the making, and uh, and he couldn't stand de Gaulle either. But de Gaulle was a great man. He was you know he was one of the uh, he's the greatest Frenchman since Napoleon, and uh, and nothing can detract from that. And Churchill recognised that nothing can detract from that. And when uh, de Gaulle attended Churchill's funeral in 1965. Um, he said that now that uh, Churchill was dead, Britain was no longer a great country, um, which at least, although obviously he was quite enjoying that fact, um, nonetheless, it did mean that he admitted that whilst Churchill was alive, Churchill, uh, Britain was a great country. Um, we are in Brazil and well, we have a, a Churchill, a chapter of the Churchill Society here in Brazil and uh, we have some follow almost 4,000 followers on our Instagram. But Churchill never said a word about Brazil. I never read it. So I wonder if you saw something about Churchill, about Brazil, or about South America. I mean, he didn't see South America or Brazil as uh, important in his strategic worldview, or did he? Um, well, he he saw the battle at the of the Falkland Islands and uh, the Coronel in the First World War as being important. He obviously thought that um, bottling up the Graf Bay in uh, Montevideo Harbor in Uruguay was important. But um, but frankly, strategically, you know, the Second World War was was um, you know the South America was not a vital theater of operations. Uh, during the Second World War, compared to the Middle East or or Europe or uh, um, or Northern Russia, for example. So uh, yes, you're right. He didn't take uh, a huge amount of um, of interest in what was going there on there. And of course, apart from visiting Cuba in 1895, um, he he didn't visit South America himself that I can think of that I can remember. Um, I might be wrong in that, but I don't believe so. So, uh, so yes, but this was t essentially because he was a strategist and that was what he was worried about. And if uh, South America was lucky enough uh, not to be the uh, fulcrum of operations in the Second World War, then I think that uh, it should feel very pleased because when you look at the devastation that was caused by Adolf Hitler um, between 1939 and 1945, um, South America was well out of it. Okay, we're coming to the end of our our show our program. So I wonder, of of the battles that Churchill fought during all his life, which would you consider his you know more difficult and more important battle? I mean, we have the Battle of Britain, the the Atlantic, and you know, and 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 the, and the, the sittings with all the with Stalin and Roosevelt. Which, in your understanding, was his you know his turning point moment where he you know he had more difficulties and more gains the 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 moment that he recognized himself to be the um the the turning point was of course um El Alamein in, in um, North okay. Africa in November 1942 um that was the that the victory there was the one um of which he said in that same speech that I mentioned earlier about the British Empire the Mansion House speech in November 1942 he said that before Alamein there were no victories after Alamein um, there were no defeats. And and that's so true. You know, uh, you can see that. Uh, of course, there was a great victory at the Battle of Britain, as you mentioned, uh, but it wasn't a land victory. And uh, and although there were some pretty bad defeats, such as um, Operation Market Garden uh, in uh, after Alamein, actually, overall, it was the fulcrum moment. Uh, for Britain, at least. Now, of course, that's not true of America. It's certainly not true of Russia. Uh, Russia was uh, the Battle of Stalingrad, which was taking, uh, which took place a little, um, at pretty much the same time as uh, as um, El Alamein. Um, but, uh, and that doesn't take into account anything that was going on in the Far East, of course, where there were some really important battles, like uh, the Battle of Midway, um, which is the fulcrum moment for the Americans in the Pacific. Um, but overall, it was pretty impressive, I think, for Churchill to spot at the time that uh, that this was going to be the uh, the fulcrum um, fulcrum moment. That's uh, Al Alamein's the one for me. Can I just say before we end, uh, sure, um, what um, what a delight it is to um, 
uh, to have heard from you a few months ago quite how successful the International Churchill Society uh, is in Brazil. I mean, that's fantastic to have 4,000 members. And uh, and it means you're able to put on, um, on some really great things. As you know, I'm dying to get there myself once parliamentary duties and my next book um, allow me to. And uh, and it will be wonderful to meet some of your your members when I manage to get to uh, Sao Paulo. Well, the moment you said I can come that the day, we will we will try to find a way to bring you in. So it Thank will you. be our pleasure to have you in Brazil for, for for some speeches and to meet the people. Thank you. Uh, following the same, we still have some minutes. Following the same, uh, I mean, he was the Battle of Alamein was his his greatest moment. What was his lowest moment? Oh, there were so many. Um, the fall of Tobruk in the June of 1942, where we lost 30,000 men um, captured. Uh, the fall of Singapore, of course, earlier that oh. year in the February, um, where the Japanese essentially uh, took that uh, that island and uh, captured everybody on um, on uh, Singapore Island on um, Singapore Island. Oh, there were some some awful defeats. The uh, sinking of the um, uh, of the Repulse and the Prince of Wales on the tenth of uh, December, nineteen forty-one. We we had, took some some really serious pastings in the Second World War. They it, they they made him depressed um, for you know, when he was thinking about them, but he was not a natural depressive. This is one of the things that people misunderstand about Winston Churchill, just as he was the, not- The black dog player, was either. not a depression. The no, black it dog wasn't. Was not a black, no, it wasn't. It was a, it was at the time that he uh, wrote about it in July, 1911. It was the only time he ever mentioned it. And it was once in a letter to his wife, Clementine. The phrase was used by, by Edwardian governesses to describe their, um, their you know children being in a bad temper um the idea of it being the same as manic depression is completely wrong he chaired 900 meetings of the um defense committee of the war cabinet it would have been impossible all times of day and night it would have been impossible for him to have done that if he genuinely suffered from such a debilitating um illness as uh, as either bipolar disorder or uh, or manic depression Okay, uh, Lord Roberts, Andrew Roberts, uh, pleasure having you here. And uh, certainly in, in your book in Brazil, it's, uh, it's uh, translated. I have the, I have the four, uh, this English version, but it's, your book is in Brazil. I know that Hitler and Churchill is in Portuguese as well. So and and also conflict is going to be coming out in conflict uh, is coming. Oh, great! Is great. coming out in uh, in Portuguese as well. Uh, yes, thank you. Okay, so uh, is there is there still a Churchill among us? Is there still someone that we can call a Churchillian in the sense of his greatness and? Uh, no, his... what you need really for um, unfortunately, well. In a way, what you need for a Churchill is to have a Churchill is a world war, and thank God we're not um, uh, we're not quite there. At least Britain isn't quite there yet. So uh, it's um, it's not something that one would ever ever want to have the need for, and, and we're not okay. we're not at that stage uh, yet. We have had great leaders. Margaret Thatcher, uh, for example, um, had showed Churchillian qualities um and uh and so on but um but the need for the man himself i think would only come uh, he would never have become prime minister had it not been for a world war so um uh by the 1930s at least uh, so um so so no there's no one on the horizon but but so that probably isn't such a bad thing frankly so we shall not wish for another churchill no, we wish for it would be lovely to have one. Of course, it'd be fabulous. But but in um, peacetime, it, in peacetime. It, but but um, you don't get them very often in peacetime. Exactly, not in uh, not in our system, at least. Okay, uh, Andrew, what were your final words for us here in Brazil? Uh, just to thank you so much, uh, Ricardo, for a really interesting hour, and uh, and to say that I've enjoyed myself very much indeed. Okay. Thank you very much. And uh, well, you have promised online here that uh, you're coming to Brazil. So let us know when and uh, we're going to have pleasure for having you here for talk 
uh, churrasco and some caipirinhas and some cigars as well. Fantastic. I love all of those. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. Have a great day. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.